So in part one, I explained the theory behind the zone system and how I thought it might benefit today's serious SX-70 photographer. And I pretty painstakingly outlined my process for taking the photos required to make a zone ruler. So if you haven't, I'd certainly recommend that you take a look at part one before continuing with part two. Anyways, laying out my collection of six towel pictures side by side reveals uh, pretty much the range of gradations possible with a Polaroid Color 600 film, which is the film I was using for this particular experiment. Now, my Zone 5 is a pretty near match to an 18% gray card, and you can sort of see it here, although they're going to get some reflections, so it's not going to be exact from what you see, but it's pretty close. From there, the, grad the gradations change um, pretty dramatically. Uh, in particular, there's a pretty sharp jump in tone uh, to the lighter zone 6. Uh, here it still shows some textural detail in the white towel, but that's pretty much gone by the time you get to zone 7. And by zone 8, there's pretty much nothing. It's just completely white. So this is an indication that the highlights really need to be pretty carefully measured with your exposure meter uh, in order to maintain detail. Now, moving to the darker zones, uh, zone 4 shows a good level of texture in the towel. Zone 3 is uh, near black but there's still some semblance of the towel texture visible. And zone 2 meanwhile is a deep textureless black. It's a good black but it's a textureless black. So this range from zone 4 to zone 2 shows that the Polaroid film is maintaining a reasonable gradation of shadows much more than in the highlights. Now Ansel Adams assigned values to each of these zones that reflect that related to uh, typical photographic subjects. And in his book Polaroid Land Photography he describes the zone descriptions for a Polaroid 52 black and white peel apart film. Uh, zone zero and one were pretty much a solid black. Zone two was the first step above a solid black, whereas zone three was pretty much the first uh, texture as he saw it. Zone four was an average shadow value. Zone five was a middle gray, in other words, the 80% gray card value. Zone six was an average um, light skin reflectance, 36%. Uh, zone six and a half was a high skin value, fairly, very bright light skin. Uh, zone 7 was a, a quite high value re with uh, reduced texture. Zone 7.5 was what he found to be the usual tex textural limit of Polaroid 52 film. Zone 8 was just below pure white and Zone 8.5 and, and 9 were in fact pure white. So the problem of course is that Polaroid black and white print film all of which are long out of production, typically had a much longer tonal range than SX-70 integral film. And Adams acknowledges in his book, and he notes that the textual range of SX-70 film is pretty much limited to zone 3.5 to zone 6, whereas Polaroid 52 peel-apart film, as I just showed, managed to range from zone 2 to zone 7.5. Now, Ansel Adams doesn't provide zone descriptions for SX-70 film and in fact I don't think I've ever seen any examples anywhere that adapt the zone system to the pretty unique tonal characteristics of SX-70 film. And therein lies the value of, I think, of, of my project, uh, creating the first ever zone system scale designed for the current 2021 crop of Polaroid 600 film. So, so further ado, I'm going to show you that zone ruler. So my zone ruler starts with the zone 2, and again that's a, a solid black. Uh, zone 2 would be a minus 3 EV or exposure value on your, on your meter reading. Uh, zone 3 would be the first step above solid black, uh, the first texture in Ansel Adams terms, and pretty much the last vestiges of details in the shadow. Zone 4 would be an average shadow value, a dark foliage, dark stone for example, or a deep shadow. Zone 5 would be that, again, that middle gray, the 18% gray card. It would be a, a darker skin tone, a clear north sky, deep blue sky for example, dark shadows, and light foliage. Zone 6 would be a textured white, 
uh, be a light skin tone, light sky, light shadows, bright flowers, for example. Zone six and a half would be a pretty pretty high um, highlight value with pretty reduced minimal texture. And then by the time you get to zone seven, you're into a pure white. So I've, I've linked, I have a link at the bottom of this to a free, freely downloadable PDF version of my zone ruler. So feel free to take advantage of that and see what it looks like. Uh, just bear in mind uh, that uh, depending on the printer and how you're viewing it, the zone ruler, um, it's always going to look different. So just use the actual tonal range shown in the ruler as as, as a base point um, and rely more on the descriptions that I have to the side here. So for this zone ruler, I've uh, desaturated each photo just to eliminate the distracting color casts. Uh, and I've also, of course, merged Anna Adams own annotations for other films such as Polaroid 52 film mentioned earlier with my own findings for the Polaroid 600 film based on not only an examination of the telephotos I took, uh, but as well as six months of photography using my zone system ruler. Both Adams and I use the term zone six and a half, and also he uses the zone three and a half, and so on, because one zone actually does represent a range of tones that span one EV or exposure value. So in practice, the Tones don't jump in discrete steps, such as shown in, in this zone ruler. The tones actually change in a continuous gradation from dark to light. For example, if zone 6 was set at f11, zone 7 would be an f8, and zone 6.5 would be between the two, about f8.5. Now on the zone ruler, of course, a half zone occurs at the borderline between these two zones. So example of five and a half would occur at the dividing line between five and six. So this is where the um, recommended zone sticker, sticker on the spot meter fives exposure scale, as I talked about in uh, part one of this episode, uh, is quite helpful because it shows each zone as spanning a full EV. So this allows me to visually place uh, a, a subject tone, for example, either in the middle of a zone f uh, zone six, or at the top of the zone six at zone six and a half, or at the bottom of zone six at zone five and a half, depending on how much detail I thought I would, wanted to be concerned about with that particular uh, subject tone. Given the limited range of highlight tones SX70 is capable of resolving, the ability to distinguish half zones is very important. Now technically the zone rulers could should be created for each type of film since each has its own unique sensitive characteristics. For example, a conventional film such as Kodak Tri-X or Ilford FP4, uh, the differences could be significant enough to warrant this approach. However, with pretty much with the current Polaroid in integral films, any differences are largely lost or unnoticeable given how variable the effect of film speed and how variable the color cast can be from film pack to film pack. Overall, there's a general lack, to, lack of consistency in the product compared to conventional film stocks. So in my test with both Polaroid SX70 and SX and 600 films, including both the black and white and color versions of each, I've found that my Polaroid 600 scale works pretty much with all of them. So feel free to give this my zone ruler a try, regardless of you know which Polaroid in integral film type happens to be in your camera. So let's take a look at the zone ruler in practice. Now, in the application of the zone system uh, in SX70 photography, it does have its limitation. First, there's no way to adjust the contrast through negative development or darkroom manipulation. The current SX70 Integral film does not have a reliable, consistent film speed. It can vary by plus or minus a third EV, meaning that there could be a potential difference of up to two, -third, two thirds EV between two packs of film. Also, while the Mint 670S camera 
admirably allows the adjustment of shutter speeds, it is in full EV stops. It goes from one shutter speed, full shutter speed, to another full shutter speed. Now the ability to change exposures in one half EV steps would certainly be helpful and certainly that's not the fault of Mint, rather it's really the nature of the original SX70 camera which has a hmm, fixed f8 aperture. So despite those limitations, it is, I, I feel, still possible to pre-visualize pre how an SX70 picture will appear before the shutter is pressed. And understanding what is, what is important in a photographic subject, an important detail in the shadows, a luminous highlight, a bright color, a skin tone, and so on, and being able to place those tones where you want them to be within the limited spectrum of SX-70 film tones is, I think, a significant advantage of using the zone system. So, I started my uh, zone system experiments back in January of 2021, and over the last six or so months, I've consistently used the zone system along with my Mint 670 SLRS and my spot meter 5 meter uh, to pre-visualize my exposures. And here's what I discovered. In general, I like to place my highlights as bright as possible, pushing them to a zone 6.5 or 7 even, somewhere around there. Now at zone 7, the highlights can appear pretty washed out, so if there are large areas of, of detailed highlight, then I find it's best to keep them uh, in the zone 6 range. Now if there just happens to be a small highlight area, I might actually push them to zone 7 in that particular situation. I like to carry a small grey card in my bag and I'll occasionally take an additional metering, meter reading of it, uh, just making sure that it's, uh, that it's in the same light that is hitting the subject. Now this allows me then to double check my pre-visualized exposure setting for the subject. And another good use of the grey card is to check the effective film speed of a new pack of film. So after loading a pack, I take a meter reading off a grey card, set my shutter speed accordingly, take a picture, and then compare it to the grey card after it's developed for the requisite 15 minutes. Then based on the results, I might change the ISO on my meter up or down uh, one half meter, one half EV for that particular pack of film. Realizing that my placed exposures might be optimistic, for example too bright, I usually take a second photo one shutter speed higher or at minus one EV. Now generally this strategy works quite well. In general my pre-visualized exposure works out, but I also have an alternative darker version just in case. So I can confidently take my photos, stash them in a pocket in the dark, and move on without having to wait 15 minutes or so to confirm that at least one of those two pictures turned out. So here are a few examples of how I've applied the zone system to pre-visualize my SX-70 photos. Now we'll start with this low contrast winter photo. Um, this one is particularly well suited to the dynamic range of SX-70 film. Uh, what I wanted is for the blue chair to be as light and lively as possible, so I place the zones in zone 6. The zone, the very white snow in the background uh, fell into zone 7.5 and, and I knew this would not retain any detail, but that was okay. I was, it was more important to maintain a bright luminous white. And this photograph pretty much worked out the way I wanted on the first try. The second photograph, taken at one shutter speed higher, in other words, minus one EV, to my mind is much, much too dark. So, also taken earlier this year is this picture of yellow graffiti on a gray concrete background with a snow, and snow in the foreground. So I placed the yellow graffiti in zone 6 and that placed the deepest black in the graffiti about zone 2.5, which would be a nice solid black. Now in this case my hunch was off a bit. So this is the first photograph which I took at 1 250th of a second and to my mind the yellows lack uh, the saturation that I was after. In my second photo, taken at a one five hundredth of a second or minus one EV, uh, it was much better. 
Now in this cold outing, uh, it was important to take the two photos quickly and get them into my warm underarm pouch to develop. However, I was pretty confident that once I got back home that at least one of them would ha would be a good exposure. In this case, the, the sort of um, uh, covering my butt by taking it, the second photograph worked out quite well. Moving on, this is a little bit more challenging situation. Uh, this is a pretty contrasty alleyway photograph taken in um, Winnipeg, in our exchange district. Um, it really challenges the limited dynamic range of the film. Now in this case, what I did is I placed the bright sunlit brick in the center in zone six and a half. I wanted to capture just enough detail to convey that it was brick while holding as much shadow detail as possible in the mid-shadow areas at the right side of the photograph which fell in zone 6. The deep shadows fell about zone 2 which was fine. Um, in this case the first photograph actually turned out much, I had pre much as I had uh, pre-visualized it. The second photograph taken at minus 1 EV was to my mind much too dark so I really preferred the, the the first photograph that I took. Now moving up the contrast east scale um, this windowsill photograph was taken in an extremely contrasty situation uh, in this case, I set up a studio LED studio light to fill the deep interior shadows, uh, somewhat anyways. Uh, what I did is I placed the awning on this little uh, Airstream trailer model at zone 6.5, knowing that this would barely convey the blue stripes on the awning. Now the LED light was adjusted so that the window sill behind the, the bullet train right here uh, would fall in zone 3. Now the first photograph was okay but the train highlights were in the top of the train were pretty much blown out. The se second photograph taken at minus 1 EV shows a lot more detail in the Airstream awning and also on the that sort of bright area of the train but the shadows are, are way too dark. Now, if I was to improve the picture, I'd probably add a lot more fill light, um, or I would probably just accept that maybe SX-70 was not the best camera for this kind of extreme lighting scenario. So here's another windowsill subject, again, pretty high contrast. Uh, in this case, it was important to convey the transparency of the blue globe's uh, brighter highlights which I placed at zone 6. Now the sunlit wood in the foreground fell at about, uh, about zone 6.5 so it still re felt it would retain some detail and then the shadows fell at zone 3, 3.5 three uh, again with some help of an LED fill light. Now as it turned out my first exposure at 1 2 of a second turned out pretty much as I pre-visualized it. My second photo taken out minus one EV or one five hundredth of a second in this case uh, was way too dark. It really lost the transparency of the glass globe. And finally uh, the last of my little interior tableaus. Um, this photograph includes a glass figurine of our Greyhound Styx and also a Polaroid headshot of our handsome guy. Both were set on a pretty dark wood mantle of our fireplace and in this case I didn't use a fill light at all. I just relied on light coming from a window far to the left. So it was important to convey the translucent tones of the again of the glass figurine as best as possible which were, I placed at zone six and a half and that that allowed the zone six SX-70 frame to go pretty white and the wood pretty black. Now remarkably the sec one quarter second exposure worked out pretty pretty well. Uh, it held the delicate tones in the glass which is the most important thing and it was pretty much as I pre-visualized pre it. 
Now, although the dark wood tones are near black, they still do retain some detail, which shows the ability of the film to capture some of those deep tones nicely. And this is the darker picture I took at minus one EV, and again, it's way too dark. Moving outside. In this picture, I wanted to capture the white bark, bright white bark on this cluster of aspens, which I placed in zone six. Now this scene was largely in shade and my exposure was based on that lighting, but it was pretty clear that the bright sky area in the background would be blown out. The second photo taken at minus one EV took care of that problem, but the white tree bark and the tree green tree foliage was, was way too dark. So and again, this is it's it's good to take the two pictures, but in the end, I generally I preferred the the original picture as I envisioned it. So this picture of a driftwood stump projecting into a lake is a light beige but with a lot of detail uh, in that in those tones and I wanted to try to capture those those very delicate tones so I placed that solidly in the center of zone six. Now the first photo captured the detail of the driftwood but overall the photograph was a bit dark and really didn't convey the setting as I pre-visualized it. Now I was at, at this location long enough for the photo to develop and that I decided to rephotograph it at a, in this case, a plus one EV. And it definitely lightened the scene, perhaps a bit too much. And in this case, it would have been nice to have the ability to make an in-between exposure at one plus one half EV, which probably would have been an ideal compromise between these two pictures. Now I had the same problem with this picture, taken in the same location really. Uh, this is a, a clump of driftwood on a sandy beach. Uh, with the driftwood placed at about zone six and a half, my first photograph, which was taken at one one thousandth of a second, was a bit too dark, and my second photo at one five hundredth of a second was a bit too light, as you can see here. Now in the end, my favorites are the later versions of both of these driftwood pictures. In the end I thought they both have more of the lively ethereal quality that I prefer for my SX-70 photographs. So my final photograph is uh, of a cluster of black-eyed Susans. Now in this case it was important to get the yellows just right, which I figured to be about a zone five and a half. And that would place the exposure at about one one thousandth of a second. But I wasn't absolutely sure. Uh, deciding on the best zone for a yellow petal for me is a little bit trickier than finding the best zone for a white. So I pulled out my trusty little gray card, uh, held it in the same light that was hitting my subject and took a reading from it. And this confirmed that my one one thousandth exposure time was likely going to work out pretty well. And uh, as it turned out, of course, the yellows turned out as I wished on the first shot. Is it worth it? Is it worth using the zone system for SX-70 photography? And in short, I would say yes. Um, as Ansel Adams would say, understanding how SX-70 film interprets the tones in the subject and how I as a photographer can use that knowledge to shape the look of a photograph is extremely valuable. Arguably the zone system is even more valuable for SX-70 photography than it is for conventional film photography. With film, I can use a zone system to produce the best possible negative, knowing that I still have many more methods to improve the final photographic print in the darkroom. With SX-70 film, getting the exposure right using the zone system is really the only option I have to produce the best possible image. So I hope you've enjoyed this rather long and detailed journey into using the zone system with SX-70 film. 
Hope you'll give it a try, see how it works for you perhaps, see if it fits into your workflow uh, with Polaroid film. And uh, let me know if, if you want in the comments below how it works out. So in the meantime, get out there with your SX-70 camera and film, start taking some pictures, and we'll see you soon. Bye bye for now.